This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. You know, one thing that I love asking guests is what advice they would give to an up-and-coming designer. But when I talked with product designer JT Trollman, I asked him what's the best advice he's been given about design. I think the best advice I've ever been given about design came from probably uh, Julie, one of our design directors, who really espoused to know your brand's core values. That if you, and if you don't have brand core values, then create them, you know, but uh, knowing those core values really gives you a guiding light through the noise of countless opinions. Find out more about Facebook and their core values at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. Whether you want a full-time job or you're looking for something temporary or freelance, we've got you covered. This week, HyperAct is looking for a strategic planner in Brooklyn. American University in Washington, D.C. is looking for a web developer. Bandcamp is looking for an editorial designer slash art director. MapZen is looking for a developer community manager. And Revision Path is looking for both staff writers and feature writers. You can apply for all of these positions on the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. And if you're looking for more jobs, then become a member of our Slack community and join the jobs channel. See you there. You're listening to the Revision Path podcast a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, I just want to remind you again about our audience survey. Go to revisionpath.com forward slash survey to take it, And everyone who finishes is entered into a drawing to win a $100 Amazon.com gift card. The audience survey closes on April 30th. Now let's talk about our other sponsors, MailChimp and Hover. MailChimp is the best software out there for sending marketing emails, automated messages, and targeted campaigns. Join more than 10 million people who use MailChimp to design and send 600 million emails every day. Sign up today at MailChimp.com. When you have a great idea, you want to secure a great domain name for it, and that's really where Hover comes in. Hover makes it easy for you to find that domain name and get it up and running with no hassle and no heavy-handed upselling. So go ahead and grab yourself a domain today, use the promo code REVISIONPATH, and you'll save 10% off your purchase. Here's our Patreon fundraising campaign update. So we're still holding steady at 33 patrons for a combined total of $224 per month. Once again, a huge thanks to everyone that has already supported the show, that has pledged your support and appreciation. It really, really does mean a lot. If you want to become a patron of Revision Path and get access to some great perks like special giveaways, early access to future episodes, and free Revision Path swag, head on over to patreon.com forward slash revision path and make that happen. Pledge levels start at just $1 per month and it's a really great way to support the show on a regular basis. Now let's get on to this week's interview. I'm talking with Dr. James H. Hill, an associate professor of computer science at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Yes, um, my name is Dr. James H. Hill. I'm an associate professor in the Purdue School of Science within the Department of Computer Information Science at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Here at IEPUI, I am the resident software engineering professor, and so I, I teach the courses on software design, software testing, software engineering at both the undergraduate and graduate level. Outside of just teaching, I'm also doing research. I have a, a pretty thriving research lab. So far, I've graduated pro- approximately 10 plus master's students, had my first PhD student just graduated last year, and uh, within the lab, we do software and system engineering research, looking at basically how to understand performance of software systems at multiple phases of the software life cycle. To do that, we cross the boundary of doing things related to model-driven development, system emulation, real-time software instrumentation, 
solve for performance analytics and just trying to pull all those things together to develop suites of tools that allow us to understand performance of large scale systems at, like I said, multiple phases of, of the life cycle so that we can hopefully find problems before they become too costly to fix. What made you want to get interested in this field? Like, how did you first get the bug to learn about computer science? I would say this interest came in a, a different way, not a traditional way that you, you know, you get interested in, in a particular topic such as computer science, because now many kids, they, they see computers and they want to do it. I got interested in computer science when I was in high school, and my interest came as an accident. It wasn't something that I was, I was you know, brought up to want to learn. And I say it was an accident because in high school and all throughout my, my childhood up into high school, I mean, through college, I was very athletic. I played baseball all year. I played baseball, played uh, football, played basketball growing up. Same thing through high school. I got into cross country, track and field, you know, very good at those sports and so forth. But my eighth grade, as I was going into high school, I did well at my middle school or junior high school track and field. I did really well and I was invited to run summer track. And that summer, I end up running summer track and field and I end up actually winning the nationals in long jump. And so, which was a very, very good accomplishment, um, you know, and throughout that time, I was having uh, spasms in my back and didn't think anything about, just always having back spasms and, and potential growing pains, you know, quote unquote growing pains. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I was really short, so I wasn't growing anymore anyway. And that school year, um, my freshman year, I went and played basketball and so forth and played on the freshman team when freshman team was when the season was over with. I was uh, advanced up to junior varsity, played junior varsity, was starting on junior varsity. And then by the time I was finishing up, you know, when junior varsity was over, I was invited to dress on the varsity team as a freshman. You know, the type of person gets to play at the very end sometimes, right? Just so we can get the feel of what it's like to be in the game. And I did well, had no problems. And in that, that spring, we had our first track meet. And it was really cold outside. It was very, very cold, about 50 degrees mm-hmm. or so. Considering back from Nashville, Tennessee, that was cold to us. Where I live now, that's kind of like nothing. Like 50 degrees is like short <laughs> weather. <laughs> All right. We hit 30 degrees. We're like, oh, it's worth shorts, right? That year, you know, that, that spring, I went to a, we had our first track and field meet. It was really cold. It had just rained. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I really, you know, we had the lone jump meet. Um, the lone jump was the event going on. And they expected me to, of course, win. And I went down there, I jumped, I had a really, really good jump, and I ended up winning. But unfortunately, when I hit the sand, the sand was so hard, and it was like basically hitting a, a hard floor, wooden floor. My feet didn't dig into the sand, and they slipped up from, from up under me. And mm-hmm. I landed right on my butt. And when I tried to get up, I was able to get up, but unfortunately, I was not able to straighten my back. Instead, I was actually walking, and I was walking with basically hunched over, like I was trying to touch my feet with my hands. And long story short, basically, after weeks and weeks of going to doctors to try to figure out what the issue was, it came back where they said I basically fractured my fourth vertebrae, long jumping. And then I turned around, they said, not only did you fracture your right side, but you actually fractured your left side this time, and you refractured your right side, your right side from that summer. So the issues I was having in the summer was I was actually jumping on a fractured back, but didn't know it. And then I turned around that summer, I mean, that, that spring, I was jumping and I hit it and re-injured the other side and the same side. And so, you know, like most kids that are going through high school, you know, that are big in sports. And I thought my life came to an end, pretty much. I, I really did. I mean, you kind of hear those movies where you see the movies where the, the doctor's telling the, the, the athlete the issue and they're and they're, they're zoned out and they're thinking about, you know, all the things that they wanted to do or could have done, right? And they're not hearing the doctor. And it just sounds like, you know, Charlie Brown's, you know, teachers talking to him like, want, 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 want. I mean, that's kind of how it was how it was to me. And at that point, my dad, you know, he was like, hey, you know, your grades are starting to slip a little bit. Now, slipping means in my, my family was if I had anything below like a B, then it was not good. I had like a B minus one of my courses and a C in one of my courses in, in middle school or going into high, high school my freshman year. And I was like, that doesn't, that's not right. No. And so he said, you know, this is a good chance to get you back on track. And he said, this summer, since I was always doing something in the summer, he said, we're going to put you in a summer program. And so I ended up enrolling in a summer program at Tennessee State University. 
It was for engineering, um, where basically they taught us different types of engineering over the course of three weeks. So we did environmental engineering, we did you know uh, civil engineering, we did electrical engineering, all the different you know learn about those different engineering um, topics. And one aspect, one topic we did was computer engineering, but they also talked about computer science. And we just learned how to do a simple program on a using Visual Basic. And from there, you know, I, I kind of liked it. We just did it for like two hours. And I got home from the program. My dad said, well, what do you like? You know, what do you like about the program? And I was like, um, it was okay. He was like, you find thing that you thought was really fun? And he was like, yeah, well, the computer stuff was fun. Because growing up, I had played with like Legos and constructs. You know, that was like my, the side of me that nobody knew. Even though I was really mm-hmm. athletic, I still was playing with these you know, puzzles. I just had puzzles, connects, um, constructs, you name it. I had it because I just I had Legos. I just love building things. So my dad was like, well, OK, well, I have an old you know, Apple II computer, the old school Apple II computers. He was like, and I got some flashcards on how to program basic. He's like, here, if you like it, try this right here. You know, it's like, keep you occupied. And so he was like, good, this is going to be something to keep me busy for the entire summer. You know, he was happy about that. And then he comes back two days later and goes, well, where have you, how far have you gone? I said, I finished everything. <laughs> and he goes, what? I was like, yeah, <laughs> I, I learned everything in that. He was like, you're not supposed to do that. And I'm like, that was easy. <laughs> he was like, okay. And so he was like, well, since you know everything, go out there and make your own programs. <laughs> and so that's basically the rest is history. And that's kind of how I got in computer science. And every year I did a own program. Um, while I, you know, I got back my, hit back, my back healed, I, I still played sports. I became Mid-State Athlete of the Year, you know, was, was really, really respected in my, in, you know, for my, my, my athletic talents. But I still did computer science on the back end. And then I did like programs where I, I you know, I went to Georgia Tech did a program. And then my senior year in high school, I took a course in C++ programming. And I pretty much knew everything in that course by the end of the first semester to where the teacher was like, you know so much, sit back here in the back play around, learn how to, you know, make games on your own and help me teach the class. And ever since that, that's kind of how I got into the area of computer science. But I still played sports, you know? Yeah. And you went to uh, to Morehouse for undergrad. Correct. Talk to me about what your experience was like there. Oh, my experience at Morehouse was was awesome. It was great. So first off, I, was just, I just wanted to go to Atlanta. I was like, I want to be in Atlanta because <laughs> that was the place to be, right? Especially if you're right. a minority. And my older brother went to Morehouse as well. And he graduated okay. in, I believe, 98, to, if I'm not mistaken. So he had graduated, or no, sorry, not 90. I think it was 90, 96. I'm not for sure. I think it was 90, 96. I can't remember. But he graduated from Morehouse College. And so I knew a little about the, about the place. And he also ran track and field there. And so I knew a little about the track and field team. And so I was like, I want to go to Atlanta. I want to go to Morehouse, you know. And I applied to other schools as well. But when I was, was considering other schools, I was fortunate enough to be invited to be in a program called the Packard Scholars Program, which was designed to get minorities to go to higher education, um, right, to get, a, to get this, you know, your pers- post-baccalaureate degree. And not just an MD, but go get like PhDs, because we had a lot of people getting MDs, but we didn't have any African-American PhDs. I mean, so it was designed for, for those people to try, to try to basically, you know, increase the numbers of minorities getting those degrees. And so I was very fortunate enough to be invited to that program and be one of the people in there. And and I always tell you the truth, it was it was through that program and just my experience on the track and field team, it was awesome. I love to travel. I got to travel a lot because of the track and field team. I love to to travel and I got a chance to travel a lot because of me being in the, the program I was in. I got a chance to go to, you know, live in California for a summer, work at Caltech, I worked at Georgia Tech, I worked at NASA, I worked in, I lived in New York for a summer. It was great. The the experiences that, you know, the cohort, our group of people that we met that were in this 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 group, I mean, we're still friends to this day. I mean, like family to this day. And we still talk all the time about, you know, how things were and, and we keep track of each other. So so my experience at Morehouse, were, I think, were, were awesome. I wouldn't trade it for the world because I think that those experiences gave me the, the foundation that I needed so that I could, you know, be able to get to to where I am today. It requires a lot of head strength, right? You have to be very headstrong to to get to this this position where I am. I would say, and I feel like Morehouse did a great job of of giving me that the the material and all the the skills that I needed so that I could be able to, you know, understand how to navigate this world and 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 be strong and and not forget who I am and 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 still at the same time, you know, be compassionate, considerate of of those that are you know that are trying to get to where I am and those that I'm interacting with on a, on a constant basis. So 
it grounded me in so many ways and, and opened my eyes that to where, like I said, I don't think I would be where I am because of because of all my experiences at Morehouse. I think those are like the ones that helped me get to where I am like the most. Do you feel like it, it also helped you when you uh, went to Vanderbilt? Because that's where you got your, your PhD. Yes, yes. I think it actually helped me a lot at Vanderbilt too as well. So at Vanderbilt, you know, I never thought I would be at Vanderbilt. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and I never thought I would go to Vanderbilt University. But I ended up there, and it helped me understand what I was looking for in an institution. So when I was at Morehouse, I kind of learned about myself. I learned what I liked. I learned what I did not like. I learned what I would have put up with. I learned what I would not put up with. I learned mm-hmm. you know, how the world would potentially view me in this particular area. Not a bad thing, right, because you know, there's very few minorities in, in the tech field, especially in graduate school, trying to get right. PhDs in computer science. So I kind of had that. I kind of knew my orientation and I knew who I was. And so that's kind of why I'm going to Vanderbilt because, because of all the experiences I experienced while I was at Morehouse, you know, the good and the bad, as I was considering different graduate schools to attend and the ones that accepted me and that wanted me to come there, I realized that those schools would be the best for me. And so that's how I ended up at Morehouse, I mean, at Vanderbilt University. And in my time at Vanderbilt, I mean, I was, because of my experiences at Morehouse, I feel like I was able to excel really fast and, and, and get through the program and, you know, and consider my time. Like I finished a program in under five and a half years, which is up under the computer, up under the average for, that's up under the, you know, the average for getting a PhD in computer science. From what I remember, I was out in five to five and a half years. And I attribute that to because I had a strong work ethic that was put up, you know, that I was, was instilled in me at Morehouse from my professors and my experiences on the track and field team to interaction within the Packard Scholar program to the, the experiences I did when I went on these summer internships, I just feel like those, all that stuff that was instilled in me, and that foundation, it, it made it so much easier for me to actually go through grad school because, because it, it was challenging at times. I mean, grad school was, was challenging at times, um, trying to get a PhD. And, and it was, you know, once you get past your courses, it becomes a mental game because you don't, you don't get a PhD by just completing your courses. You get your PhD when your advisor says you're done. And you're only done if you've done enough work <laughs> that contributes to the field. And so at that point, you really are basically going against yourself in my mind, right? You can say, oh, I'm going against my body. No, you're going against yourself because in the end of the day, you are your worst enemy, right? And you're your biggest supporter. So you have to understand how to develop to push through those times where, hey, you know what? You got, you've been working on the same experiment for six months and it's not working. What the heck is wrong, Right. And to me, that was remind me of being on the track and field, right? I'm doing a 400 and I'm on the last 100 meters of that 400 and you got to push through. Either you push through or you basically give up and you stop, right? I mean, and that's kind of how it was when get, trying to get this PhD at Vanderbilt. And, and again, it's not, it's, like I said, it's not the university doing nothing to you. It was just you had to, to be able to push through yourself. But also you had to be able to recognize you know, what environment was going to be supportive of you, you know, getting that PhD and, and helping you get through to the end. And I had great advisors at Vanderbilt. So I was able to recognize, you know, who at the university would be very supportive of me. And they all were. But, you know, I was able to find, you know, that university that would be very supportive. And that was Vanderbilt at that time. And I found the right advisors and and they, they basically fought for me and I fought for myself. And they saw as long as I kept putting the work in, they were willing to continue funding me and so forth. And at that point, it's you have to do it yourself. And like I said, it's, it's because of all the stuff I did back at Morehouse that I felt like I had that that strength to just push through because you get a lot of folks that, you know, they'll be in a PhD program for seven, eight, nine years and they'll just stop. Right. They'll get past their qualifiers where they say, hey, I'm going to do this to finish up my PhD work. Here's my proposal. And they'll defend their proposal. But they'll spend three, four five years between the proposal and their defense. Because they're trying to push through. And at that point, you have to determine when you have to basically, you know, push it yourself. Your advisor is not going to push you that much. It's, it's up to you to, to continue pushing through. And I think that, you know, that all that was built into me. It just helped me get through the program and helped me at Vanderbilt a lot. With the, the work that you've been doing, of course, you know, you, you got your PhD and things like that. And you said that you worked for a couple of companies. What made you decide to go into education? So it was more of opportunity. I felt like... Um, opportunity that was there and the the flexibility that I would get. So one thing I, I will say that I did, and I look back to when I was in high school, I was, you know, I was like, I'm glad I did this, where I would kind of like 
investigate, you know, test out the wires in different locations, see what I liked, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to be an engineer, but I know I want to be a computer scientist. So when I was in high school, I did a, a research paper in my English class on, do I want to be a computer science or computer engineer? And I did a full research paper on that. And from that, I learned I want to be a computer scientist, right? So when I got into undergrad, you know, I was like, well, what do I like? Do I want to go into industry or go into, you know, to grad school? And even though I was in a program to get PhD, you know, to, to motivate me to get a PhD in computer science, it wasn't a requirement, right? They wanted you to go to grad school, but it wasn't a requirement. And I found out that because of all that, I wanted to go to grad school. I wanted to do research, so I went to grad school. When I got to grad school, I was like, I did stuff in industry and I did stuff in research and, you know, continuing research stuff. And I realized from that, maybe academia was probably best for me because of, of what I wanted to do, because I didn't want to work for anyone personally in mm -hmm. terms of like a company at that point in time. I want to, to work for myself. I want the flexibility. And when I talk with my advisor about this, you know, he said, if you go into academia, think of it as like me and corporate. He said, you're basically your own little company. He's like, as long as you act like that, you will always have research money coming in. And you will always basically have students and, and continue to change and, and do cutting edge research and so forth. And so when I realized that I could do everything that I wanted, right, own a company, which is my research and get the dollars, right? Made my own hours and not have to really work for, you know, a, a company in a say. I chose to go academia and plus I like teaching. I loved, when I was at Morehouse, I used to always be whole instructional, you know, like tutoring sessions for people in my, in my classes, right? Mm -hmm. And I used to do that all the time, you know, and I loved it. I, I like seeing people get that, you know, eureka moment when you, they're looking at a complex problem or a complex topic and they can't understand it. And then you explain it to them in a way that they can relate to it. And they go, oh, that makes sense, right? I love that experience, right? And so I decided to go to academia because I realized that that's where I would have, be able to do everything I wanted to do. But at the same time, though, I could still do my own consulting on the side through freelancing, which I can do, right? So I can get the best of all worlds that I wanted. And so that's kind of why I went into academia. I just realized that if I went to academia, I had to deal with the tenure track, right? So I had to kind of put a lot of my personal ambitions on the side and focus just on getting tenure. And honestly, that was something I was willing to do because I realized that if I got through the tenure process, then more things would be open to where I can start doing the real work that I want to do, right? I can focus on doing things that may not bring in dollars, but it could, it could change some way we do something in software and so forth. And so, you know, now I'm through that tenure process, I'm really seeing the, the benefits of where I can really do some more impactful things, not only just at the community level, but with not only with my research, but at the community level as well. I'm glad I came in this area too. What are some of those things? Because I would imagine that as one of the youngest black tenure professors in computer science, that might put a lot of pressure on you as far as like leaving a legacy. So what are kind of the, the projects and things that you're working on right now? Sure. So, I mean, like for research wise, in terms of, of, of that, I'm doing a lot of work with the Australian Defense Science Technology Organization. They've been funding my research a lot in terms of, of how to build, you know, large scale systems that they don't really know too much about right now, right? They're still in that design phase. And it may take them five, 10 years before you even start writing a single piece of code for that system. So I'm doing a lot of work in that area. And that right there is really, is really specific to a, a niche area. But the impactful stuff that I'm, you know, like you're talking about, I'm looking at doing a lot. Now I'm actually the, I'm having opportunities where I'm doing more outreach dealing with, you know, minorities and, and underrepresented groups in, in computer science and, and specifically looking at those that are student athletes. I have several proposals on the, you know, in that, in that realm that I'm working on several, you know, projects I'm working in that realm. I have also, I'm doing some stuff within the, within our department that unfortunately I can't really discuss that right now because we're in the process of trying to get it off the ground, but it's definitely something that's going to be looking at trying to improve the readiness of students for, for industry. And um, like I said, I've, have, I've had the blessing of my, my chair. I've had the blessing of my dean. I've got the blessing of our vice chancellor of research, which basically oversees all the research for the university. They all love the idea and they've, they've given their, their blessing and you know we're trying to get move forward with it. And they've all said this can be very, very impactful. So you know, unfortunately I can't discuss that right now, but I'm more happy to once we get it, you know, off the ground and get it, you know, not established, but get off the ground and we start getting some traction with it, be more happy to discuss it with you just so you can kind of see some of the stuff that we're I'm trying to do that I feel will actually leave a legacy for me within the department and hopefully within this community, local community here in Indianapolis and hopefully within the state. And they've said this idea can definitely be something to be replicated across the entire country. 
the other universities. So hopefully this this does take to take place and we can get the traction we're looking for. But that's the kind of stuff that I'm I'm happy about being able to do now, because again, that right there, it's it means no doubt I mean, no research dollars are tied to that. It's me just trying to find something that I can. I can give to give back to the community, put my name on it, give back to the community, and try to have some kind of positive impact that will basically strengthen, you know, not only our program here, but strengthen, you know, the the folks that are going to computer science as they leave leave education or leave the undergraduate curriculum and so forth. Walk me through like what a typical day is like for you, because it sounds like you're doing so much stuff between your classes, and then you said you also have a lab that you're running. Just kind of walk me through what's what's a typical day like. Yeah, and just not leave out my my beautiful wife and my nine month old son who takes a lot of my time as well, <laughs> <laughs> in a good way, All right? So a typical day of mine is is you know wake up in the morning, you know seven o'clock in the morning because that's what time my my son gets up. So I used to before I had my son, I would be in bed to like nine o'clock because I was up all night working. Right. <laughs> but now my, my son, he sleeps through the night, but he gets up at seven o'clock on the dot every day. Wow. You know, he's not. And, he's, and you hear him in the through the little speaker just yelling, like, come get me, come get me, basically. So, you know, I get out the bed about seven and then I spend, you know, one or two hours with him in the morning time getting ready for, you know, spend some time with him since I know that I'll be, um, you know, out the, the house for most of the day. And then depending on what day it is, if it's like a Monday or Wednesday, the day as I teach. Then I'll head into the office about, you know, 10 o'clock or so and get to office about 1030 and I'll sit in my office and try to get whatever slides I can ready for class. If I have to, you know, go over and make sure everything's okay. And then around, you know, on Monday and Wednesday, my office hours start from 10, start at 1130. I'm in office hours from like 1130 to 1. Then I try to grab something to eat really fast. And then at 130, I go to teach my software design course. I mean, I teach that from 130 to, to, you know, for an hour hour and 15 minutes, so about to 245. And then since this is a new course I introduced this semester, it was filled to capacity. So I had 75 students in the course uh, when it first started. And unfortunately, you know, students have had to withdraw from the course, but I had a pretty good number of, of students in the course. And so usually I have a, a league of students that are asking all kinds of questions about what happened. So I try to fill those questions and then make it down to my 3.30 meeting. And I'm using the meetings from 3.30 to, to 5.00. And then I try to head on home to make it home so I can feed my son, you know, I like to feed him dinner, feed some, feed my son some dinner and spend time with him from six to seven till he goes to bed. And then from 730 until, you know, 11 or 12, I'm usually doing more research, either writing papers, looking up stuff for proposals, grading papers and so forth or doing that. So I'm usually busy like that. And then within that time, I try to, you know, spend one or two hours with my wife. So, you know, Carl, I had probably like three hours. And then about two, three hours in the evening to try to get some work done. And that re- reboots itself. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I don't really teach. I don't teach any classes. And so at that day, that time, usually Tuesday and Thursday, I'm usually in the lab doing research, right? I'm not doing research or guiding, I'm doing research or guiding my students um, on their research. And so you tell us how they have questions on what they're doing, want to show me some results, ask questions about different design choices and, and, and ways they should go with that. And so I spend time feeling that filling those, my students and fill, filling their, their questions and so forth. And usually on Tuesday, Thursday, I'm also doing meetings. And so you ask any of my students, I'm usually in meetings a lot. <laughs> One thing I found out is when you become an associate, you actually get more work, <laughs> which is a good thing, right? And so usually I'm actually now on more and more projects. And one thing we found out, I'm finding out is that because of my area of software engineering, I'm having a lot of people actually coming to me for collaborations to assist them with engineering a system, whether it's in the nursing or in the medical or in uh, informatics, right? And so I'm usually brought in for those or right now I'm always going to meetings related to, you know, for a center for healthcare and aging brain care. And I'm actually now, I'm actually right now their resident software and system engineering professor expert. Right. And so I'm usually getting pulled into those kind of meetings. Right. Like Monday, I have a meeting with somebody, you know, a high person up in one of the hospitals to help discuss security measures. Right. And engineering a system for security and so forth. And so a lot of times I get pulled in these different meetings, and that just basically happens on Tuesdays and Thursdays. On Fridays, I try to basically use that, that time for myself where I won't come to school, and I'll just, you know, hide away at another location close to my house and just sit there and try to get work done, <laughs> so forth. And that's kind of what happens. On days I on, on in the fall, I usually teach two courses. And so on that day, on those days, usually it's on Monday and Wednesday, so I have courses back-to-back. And so I'm usually teaching basically for three hours straight. On, I mean, for, yeah, almost three hours straight. And those days are very, very tiring. But then again, it, the same process happens over and over again. In the summertime is where I truly enjoy because at that point I can I get more free time to do research, 
right? Because in the school, during the school year, I'm usually doing mostly teaching and my, my students are doing the research. In the summertime is when I actually get a chance to, you know, I really have more time to not only just direct the research, but to actually do the research, do some research myself. And many times in that case, I'm doing stuff that's not funded, you know, and I'm trying out new areas, right? Hey, here's an idea I have. Let's see if this actually could turn out to be something. If it does, then I write a proposal for it and try to get some funding for it. If it doesn't, you know, it's something I'll just take as a risk, right? Just like any company does. So some of times where I usually take, do my risky research when it's just me doing the work. And many times I also will have maybe high school students come into my lab and I'll mentor those students as well. And that's because how my schedule usually looks. It's pretty busy. It's a pretty busy schedule. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, how do you find time to like juggle all that? Like you've got all this work and research that you're doing, but then you also have your family and a new son. Like how do you juggle all of that? I guess I have a very loving wife. <laughs> <laughs> it's just discipline. It's discipline, yeah. right? Um, I think it's just stuff that was built into me from, you know, starting at Morehouse through Vanderbilt to to now I use it to to here, right? And one thing I've learned is that you work work smart, not hard, right? So you kind of learn, you know, how to basically be more be very efficient at doing something, right? And that way you you don't get bogged down in in all the the details that may be a distraction and so forth. And so that's kind of that's kind of how it is. And also, it boils down to having good structure within your lab, so you kind of hopefully have you know, people that can help lead other people, right? So before I had, you know, before this semester, I had my PhD student and he just graduated, right? So he, you know, he was really good at, you know, being that person that could help, you know, direct some of the research too, because again, he's learning as well, because eventually he may become a professor. So at that time, it's kind of like you just put a structure in place so that a lot of the, the, the things that you think will probably get to you, you have barriers in place that will help you take some of that pressure off of you so you can focus on doing some things. And then when things get to you, at that point, it's like, okay, this is kind of like, it needs to be addressed really big. You know, it's something that's very serious. And that's kind of how you, you how I was able to, to manage, right? It's just you have the right structure in place. Because at one point in time, I had about 10 people working in my lab at one point. <laughs> um, and so you have to have the right structure in place. Otherwise, you have a lot of people and you just, you become overwhelmed with stuff, right? And so that's kind of how I, how I get around with managing. It's just you, you understand how to work smart, and how to actually, you know, have the right structure in place so that, you know, hopefully the lab can govern itself. Yeah. And you're teaching like a lot of students, like you mentioned, master students, PhD. Are you teaching undergrad students yes, as well? Yes, yes. Like this course on software design is, is all undergrad. Um, okay. And I had 75 students in it. And, you know, the, the chair was like, whoo, hey, don't teach that. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I, I'm going to figure it out, you know. <laughs> but usually I have, when I teach my software engineering courses in the fall when it's undergrad, I used to have about 50 students in that course. So usually I, I would teach, I'm usually teaching about 50 to 80 students per semester, you know, you know, across my classes. And you just learn how to manage, honestly. You just learn how to manage. And you realize, and you have to realize that, you know, teaching, you know, that's, it's important because you have students that depend on you, right? And so you can't just say, I'm going to go in there and lecture, 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 and then walk away. You know, you go in a lecture and, and, and you ask my, you know, students, I try my best to make myself available outside of class, right? So if you have any questions, mm -hmm. email me, right? I'll try to get back to you within one or two days, right? We have discussion boards. Put stuff on the discussion boards. I'll try to get to that, to get to that within that time at nighttime when I'm about to go to bed, right? You have TAs, right? Use your TAs. Make sure you can talk to them, right? So you just have that, that stuff in place, right, to make sure you can, you can manage all that. But it can definitely become overwhelming if you know you don't put the stuff in place to to make sure it happens correctly now within like the past few years you know the current administration has put a lot of focus on students learning how to code getting into stem fields particularly computer science as an educator have you started to kind of see the dividends from that like have you seen more you know people interested in computer science as students and also and this is kind of just a bonus question to that what are some fields that are in computer science that are sort of up and coming that students need to know about if they want to do research on? Sure. So first of all, I would say I think that initiative that the president, you know, President Obama is doing, I think that's awesome. You know, in our department, when we hear that, we just we get so excited because we're like, yes, you know, <laughs> it's like they're seeing the importance of this because no matter when you think about it. Everything in this world is, is almost driven by computer now, right? Your cars mm -hmm. are like 80% computers, right? I mean, computers are touching every aspect of, of this world, right? Every discipline is being touched by computers. And so first off, I'm very, we're very thankful, and especially I'm very happy they're doing that. 
as far as like seeing the dividends pay off, I would say, yes, you know, we are seeing it. I, w- I would say that. But we probably don't really, really see the true dividends for, you know, two or three years down the line, right? Because it takes some time for this stuff to build up, right? Because you got to think about this, just because you're teaching, co- you're saying go out there and learn how to code, and he's saying an hour coding a day or whatever, you still have issues at the, you know, the, the high school level or the, the junior high school level or the middle school level where they don't have computer science courses at all either, right? So it's really based on, on, on volunteerism and so forth. And even though you say, hey, you can learn, out, learn this out here, you go, in, you go into your high school and you may not have the course, it may not even be, it may be considered computer science, but not really be computer science, right? And so until, I mean, this is great. I think it's a, a good first start, a good start. But hopefully this will influence the, at the state level and so forth to go in there and, and, and start making the necessary modifications so that this becomes not only something that's like, hey, it's cool to do, but something becomes a requirement, right? And we see some states starting to do that, which is, which is a good thing, right? Because in order to do computer science, you just can't learn how to code. Computer science really is more than just coding. It's critical thinking, it's logic, it's math, right? And so you have to really have the students in, at the high school level have to basically have the right courses in place that was going to actually help them develop those skills. Because if you can't think logically, if you are you know, having trouble thinking logically, if you're having trouble thinking, having trouble with math and having trouble doing problem solving, then it's, you're going to have a harder time in, in computer science and coding just can't stop solve that, right? But Hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, just doing a coding course on, on online is not going to help solve that, right? And so hopefully, you know, you, you'll start seeing the curriculum at the, you know, pre-college level starting to change, right? And hopefully I will start, this is pushing that direction, and we'll see more, more changes like that. So I think that that's great and so forth. Now, in terms of up-and-coming areas and so forth, I will say that the, the hot area right now, as, as, as I know, is definitely software engineering, right? So there are not enough people out there that are programmers, right? I would, it's, I would say, it's, I mean, it's not up-and-coming, but it's always going to be important. If you look out there, the up-and-coming areas, right, I mean, there's a lot of work in the, the big data side, right? I mean, it's there, right? And that's always going to be there. We're seeing a, the big up-and-coming area that I would say is more of the Internet of Things, right? The, the idea that everything is connected via the Internet, right? You have not just your phone, but you have your house. You have the, the healthcare stuff, right? All of that right there is being connected. And I'm actually working on, on several projects right now in the healthcare world where it is dealing with the Internet of Things stuff, right? That is a, a up-and-coming area, and that's going to definitely transform, you know, how we interact with systems, and and it's going to transform how we, you know, how this world behaves in my mind. And so... And so that's an up-and-coming area, but in order to get to that area, you have to understand how to do the fundamental stuff, right? Mathematics, you have to understand logical, you know, logic, you have to understand, criti- do critical thinking and problem solving. From that, you can then start programming. From that, you can start working on area thing, thing, you know, things. That's a big jump, but you can start building all the necessary, all the, the intellect that's needed so you can, can play in that space, right? But that's definitely an up-and-coming area that I would, you know, say that, you know, you should look into, right? And we've seen that with the cars, you know, the connected cars, your your connected homes. I mean, even you go into, like, some department stores or some, you know, big box stores, and you'll see, like, the refrigerator that can, t- you know, play Pandora. <laughs> I've seen that before, right? I mean, that's a really, really cool, cool area, right? The Amazon Echo, right? You know, that yeah. that's a cool area, right? And that's all the Internet of Things stuff, right? Everything is connected. Yeah, like I'm pretty sure every device in my apartment can play Netflix, (laughs) like everything. So I I get what you mean with that whole kind of Internet of Things. And I like how, you know, companies are really, I want to say democratizing it and bringing it to the consumer in a number of different ways. Of course, you've got Amazon Echo, but you also have smaller things like connected outlets and things Mm -hmm. like that, like small components that you can use to sort of transform wherever you're at into like this connected smart home sort of thing right, like your light bulbs right that can that can that can turn on or your doorbell right i mean right. all that stuff right that is a hot area right but you see it's it's changing how things behave right you got your driverless cars right i mean just imagine all that stuff working together right you're in your car and you're driving it senses that you're close to home it then turns on your all your stuff in your in your house it disarms your security system which could be an actual problem right <laughs> unfortunately mm-hmm. if your car got stolen Right. I mean, all that. Right. Just that is the up and coming area. Right. This whole connected, the sensor based connected world. So that is a very, a very cool area. And that's what that's an exciting area. And that's what excites me, too, because, again, that crosses a lot of my stuff. Right. I may not be doing the home or whatever, but it's still engineering. Right. Is there still engineering problems in there? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of what's talked about in the industry right now, particularly when it relates to getting more people of color involved in 
you know, the tech field is about the pipeline or the issue of like the leaky pipeline, et cetera. As a black professor of computer science, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Do you feel like this is a big factor that's affecting students today? What, what are your thoughts on that? So in terms of that, that leaky pipeline and this whole area and so forth, I think there is an issue where there's, of course, there's not enough diversity, right? We see it, right? And, and I see it in my classes and so forth in terms of the number of minorities, especially African-Americans and so forth, right? But in terms of them saying there's nothing out, no, no, no out there, I think that there's these companies looking in the wrong location, <laughs> right? You go mm-hmm. to Morehouse College, you got a computer science department, right? You go to FAMU, you go to Tuskegee, right? You you got these places that have it. They're just not looking in the right places. But at the same time, though, I think there still is, there's still, it can always be improved, right? So, for example, you know, most of the time, some of these, you know, minorities and represented people, they're coming from, from places where they may not have the same, you know, opportunities as folks coming from backgrounds where they have computer science, right? And what you'll find out is that, that leaky pipeline hills because they don't have folks that they can relate to. They don't have folks that they can talk to. They feel like they're on their own, right? And so when you feel like you're on your own, what you do, you usually just drop out, right? And you, mm-hmm. you change into something that's more comfortable, right? You know, you may say, you know what? There are a lot of my folks or my friends are getting doctor's degrees or becoming lawyers, right? Someone do that, right? Because you feel comfortable because you're around folks, you're around co- you're a cohort that you can relate to, right? That's a huge challenge. And that's where that pipeline, it, that's where a leaky pipeline can be in, in my mind, right? Is that when you get past your HBCUs, you have that lack of, of support that's needed to, to help people push through. Now, I was very fortunate I had the support, right? But I can tell you right now, I, I, tell, I talk to my, you know, my colleagues about this. I say, there were times where I felt isolated, right? And it's not it's nothing that Vanderbilt did. You know, it's nothing mm-hmm. they did. They, they didn't do it. It's just because when I looked around, I didn't see anyone who reminded me of myself, right? I was very fortunate that we, I had, we had an African-American, you know, uh, professor in in the the school of electrical engineering and computer science we had one uh, dr robinson and i could go talk to him right because there are some things that you just won't talk to someone else about you know it's just how it is and that's what that pipeline has because when you, you get that leak because when you can't find somebody you can relate to then you end up you know you end up leaving right or you feel like you're by yourself or you if you, you, you try to find stuff to, to help you push forward right and when you actually if you leave then the next person come through, guess what? They're not going to see you. They're not going to, you're right. not going to have that. And that's kind of where it, where it happens. So when you leave that HBCU, you have that, that issue right there. And I've experienced that, but I was, I was very fortunate to where, you know, I have folks at Vanderbilt, I was very fortunate where I had, I had an advisor who supported me 100%. Like, I mean, awesome. And he understood the importance of, you know, me actually seeing folks who reminded me of myself. Right. That, that looked like me, that had that were in places that I want to go. And so he was like, my brother was like, if they ever saw, a, I would tell you, I mean, they didn't say this, but I knew this, what you know, I feel like this is what they're doing. Was that, and I'm, I'm very appreciative that if they saw an African-American male who had a PhD in computer science, they made sure I, I met him. They made sure I met him. So I can say, hey, I can ask questions because they knew that I would ask them questions that I would probably not ask them. And they never got offended about it. He was, and they were just like, hey. I hope you plan on keeping in touch with him, right? And they said in a way, it's like, you know, I'm here for you, but you need that other support that may be able to feel stuff that I can't feel. And to me, I think that's why I, I think they're like, they're awesome advisors because they pushed me and they, like I said, not only they pushed me, but they realized, they put, they made, they realized that I needed a, a good support network because of the, the, you know, me being there and I was the only African-American and so forth. And I had a great support network with my, with my group, but they knew I needed more than just, just that. They knew I needed other stuff. Right? And they did a great job of that. And that's kind of how that leaky pipeline happens. Because, like I say, you, when you start getting, you start advancing up and up and up, there's fewer, fewer of us up there, right? I think I was the only African-American PhD in the computer science department at Vanderbilt after my third year because another one, because one of the former PhD students there, he unfortunately left the program because he, he, he stopped at his master's and left. At that point, I was the only one in computer science. And... I had to search outside of computer science to find people that I could associate with. And so my best friends came from, you know, came from biochemistry and from uh, electrical engineering. They weren't in computer science. You know, I had those cohorts and, and I would see them maybe once every other week or so. So I wasn't around, you know, constantly around them. Right. And so they did a great job of trying to make sure that, but they, and they realized that, you know, like, Hey, they're not in computer science. <laughs> 
they're not in computer science. And so they, they did a great mm -hmm. job of trying to make sure that I, I had that so that I could hopefully address that leaky pipeline. And that's kind of what I do now is that when I see minority students, I try to reach out to them I'm like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> you know, how you doing? You can talk to me if you need to. Right. I do my best to try to help them get through in terms of, of saying, hey, you know, you can always ask me questions. I, I'm not I'm here for you. Right. Because I know that the stuff that I experience, they may experience as well. Right. And, and my job is just to help them feel feel comfortable in terms of of, hey, it's going to be a hard road, but you can make it. You know, you can make it. I did it. You can do it, too. Right. I'm a, I'm an athlete. So, I mean, I could be an athlete, I did all this stuff, but guess what? I'm a computer science professor now, <laughs> you know? So, like, you can do it too, and that's what's needed. Right. I totally understand that. Let's kind of switch gears here a little bit. You mentioned, you know, a little bit earlier about that there was someone that was in the program when you were at Vanderbilt that really kind of helped you out in terms of putting you in situations or putting you together with people that could help you advance. Who have been some of the mentors that have really helped you out along the way? Yes, I I would definitely say I can I could name several people. So my primary advisor, Dr. Anaruda Gokli, you know, and my co-advisor, Dr. Douglas Schmidt from Vanderbilt University, they were very instrumental in putting me in the right places at the right time. Right? I mean, they. I mean, if you look for if I was looking for a mentor, right, who actually did everything right. I mean, I've like they did it right. Mm -hmm. Then I had Dr. Uh, Larry Dowdy. Or Lawrence Dowdy, um, he's retired from Vanderbilt, but he was a, also a mentor in terms of just being able to talk to him about personal things, right? That I knew I was okay to talk to him about, right? And he did. We we just have discussions, 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 discussions about just things that weren't related to academia, right? Things that weren't related to research. I'm just going to talk to him because he he he. Some reason why we just we just clicked, right? And it was it was. I can always talk to him. He had very good advice and so forth. Dr. Robinson from Vanderbilt, he was very good in terms of like if I just had issues related to just things I knew that only I could talk about with another minority, I could talk to him about it, right? I mean, so those were some 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 awesome, you know, advisors and, and mentors that I had. And then when I go back to, to to undergrad, one mentor, you know, that I would always say was gave me helped me understand, you know how to be strong and how to push through it was my coach back from, from Morehouse College in Coach Hill and, and Coach Dumas, right? Coach Barry and all these, the, the coaches for the Morehouse track and field team, right? They were also mentors in terms of like, uh, just helping me understand how to stay strong, right? How to push through pain, how to push through obstacles, how to push through adversity, right? And so, I mean, I can name a lot of, a lot of mentors, right? That I can look at and say, you know what, you did this, you gave me this, you gave me this, and you gave me this, and and it was, you know, they. I was very blessed to be, you know, to have those people in my life. What keeps you motivated and inspired to continue? The possibilities, opportunities, and the rewards. Honestly, it's, it's a lot of that right there. It's a lot of opportunity in this in in this field, especially in computer science. A lot of opportunity. The rewards that I, I love the fact that. Just seeing, like, and especially in academia, right, when, I, when I'm teaching, just seeing students' faces just light up, right? When I'm teaching a concept and they write back to me in an email saying, oh, my gosh, I really like this. It's almost like I'm, like, I had one student say, said, it's like I'm learning magic from a magician. Like, these concepts, they just seem, they're just so awesome, right? Why have not learned this stuff? And their, their faces just light up like a kid in a candy store, right? When you see that, that just keeps me going, other things, right? Just the fact I just love building stuff that keeps me going, right? So all that time, like I wake up, I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. I'm like, but I wake up and I'm like, you know what? I'm tired, but I'm doing what I love. I'm actually mm -hmm. doing what I truly love, and so that wakes me up every morning. And honestly, to tell you the truth, it's some reason why I probably don't go to sleep at night either. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> so screw waking up. I just don't go to sleep, right? So that those days where I'm up at three o'clock in the morning doing something. And then my wife goes, what time do you go to bed? I'm like, um, one o'clock, <laughs> you know? And she's like, no, you didn't. It was like, yeah, I, did. I went to bed at three o'clock in the morning, you know, 3.30. And I had to wake up at seven o'clock the next morning. She's like, you're going to be really tired. I'm like, yeah, I know. But she knows I'm, I'm doing what I love, right? It keeps me mm -hmm. up because there's so much to do. I, I just cannot get enough of it, right? So that's what keeps me going. Where do you see yourself in like the next five years or so? Next five years, hopefully the stuff that I'm working on right now, you know, this stuff... With, for this outreach kind of stuff, hopefully I see that, you know, that taking off and me directing that stuff really well. I would love to basically be up going for full professor, 
which would be my next major goal, um, to become a full professor. And if, if things work out well, I would love to, you know, have my own little, my own little startup that's actually based off my work and stuff going well. So, so those little things I've been contemplating, but again, all of it just takes time, right? And so I have to basically really look at, you know, based on what I'm doing now, where I see myself going in the future, you know, which ones would seem more, more valuable. Because again, as I'm learning, as I'm getting older and older, I'm getting tired and tired, <laughs> right? So I don't have that same spunk that I had when I was in undergrad where I could stay up and get to code like crazy. Now I'm like, yeah, I can code. But I'm just like, hey, yeah, you know, whatever. I hear you. You know, I but again, I, it, but again, th- but it still keeps me going, right? So, but yeah, so in five years, I have a lot of things that I, I can see myself doing. The real thing is I'm just waiting to see where the chips fall, right? So I'm the type of person, I like to invest in a lot of different things. And then hopefully the chips will, we'll see where the chips fall. And wherever those fall, that just helps me figure out what my next step will be and so forth. Would you want your son to kind of follow in your footsteps in that way? That's a very good question as well. Yes and no. I would love for him to follow my direction, right? Be really good in athletics to pursue computer science. Not to mention my son already knows how to type on a keyboard at nine months. He knows if he sits on my lap in front of the keyboard in front of my laptop, he puts his hands on all the keys and just starts hitting them like he's typing like he's me. <laughs> so it's so cute. So he's already knows how to actually go to my computer and do stuff. And if he sees me on my computer, he'll he'll crawl over to me now and he'll try to get to the computer. And I have to like stop him. <laughs> but I would love him to do that, right? But at the same time though, I want him to be his own person. Right. I want him to decide what he wants to do. So if he follows in my footsteps, great. I would love it. You know, he's already my name, he already has my name, right? So he's already a junior. If he follow in that same footsteps, That'd be great. But if he decided to that he wanted to, you know, do a different type of science or whatever, that's that's fine, right? We just ask that education is big in our family, right? So we you know we just hope that we can get him in, you know, he goes to college and he pursues, he gets a PhD. Awesome, right? But whatever he does, we just want him to be the best at what he does, right? That's just what any parent wants, right? right? And we're gonna try to be as very supportive of anything that he wants to do, right? As long as he just gives it his all, right? And I think that's something that he has already built into him where he tries to do it his best already at nine months, right? He doesn't like not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, just to kind of wrap things up, where can our audience find out more about you and follow your work and your projects and things online? Sure. Yeah. So my my website through my university is www.cs.iupui.edu slash tilde hill j as in h-i-l-l-j also i'm on twitter at at hill j h 82 and on that you'll definitely see some of the collaborations that i'm doing within different departments especially like the school of nursing on some projects i'm working with Mm -hmm. that's trying to basically do some connected medical devices that are going to actually change have a have a good impact we think on how folks deal with medications and so forth and it's, it's, it's some pretty cool stuff that we're working on and you'll you'll definitely be able to follow some of the, the research we're doing on there because we're very live with tweeting the collaborations and, and what we're working on and so forth. And if you could add me as a friend on Facebook, I do a lot of posting as well on my Facebook page, I'm James H. Hill, about things that I'm doing and, and, and papers that are published and so forth. From my website, you can definitely find my different, different types of, of social, my pages on different social networks such as LinkedIn, Twitter, ResearchGate, which is where we, you know, where papers are published or, or where you can actually see some of the papers that have been published and so forth. But yeah, definitely look me up and, and I would love for you to follow me so you can keep abreast of all the things that I, I'm doing within my, my research lab as well, also within just the community of computer science in general. All right. Well, it sounds good. Well, James, thank you again so much for coming on the show, for sharing a lot of the work that you're doing at IUPUI, but also I think, you know, just your your backstory about how you got into the field and then sharing what new students or even current students should look into for the future, I think is something that's going to be really helpful for a lot of people. So thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thoughts of love are in and that's it for this week. Big thanks to Dr. James H. Hill. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Dr. Hill and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Thanks, of course, as always, to our sponsors, Facebook Design, MailChimp, and Hover. Facebook Design works on an enormous and diverse range of interesting problems. No one designs at scale quite like Facebook does, and that scale is only matched by their commitment to giving back to the design community. 
Learn more about designing at Facebook at facebook.com forward slash design. When it comes to email marketing, MailChimp makes it simple. They have great in-depth reporting, new and improved autoresponder features, and you can send 12,000 emails to 2,000 subscribers for free. No contracts and no credit card required. Check them out at MailChimp.com. Hover takes all the hassle and confusion out of buying and managing your domain. Search for a few keywords and Hover will show you the best available options across all the domain extensions out there. Are you ready to get started? Save 10% off your first purchase by using our promo code REVISIONPATH at checkout. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro is by Music Band Dre with intro and outro audio by Yellow Speaker. Leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. It not only helps us get new listeners, it also helps us move up the podcast rankings, and I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. If you like the work Revision Path is doing with the podcast and the website, then visit us over at Patreon and become a patron. Just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge your support. Pledge levels start at just $1 per month and you'll get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Thanks again so much for listening and we'll see you next time.